When we released our playthrough video of Escape the Dark Castle last year, we received a recommendation as to the game we should play next, and it was one that I had personally not stumbled across. A solo board game built around the horror movie trope of the last survivor of a group of friends beset by the killer, who at the last moment finds the strength or the courage to take on her adversary, and against all odds, survive. I freely admit that my experience of solo board games, or even solo modes within board games, is not the most extensive. For me, the social aspect of board gaming is probably more paramount than the game itself, but I was intrigued by the premise and eager to see whether this game was one I would try purely for the purpose of review, or whether it would become a game I would genuinely want to play for my own pleasure. With Series 3 of this game currently live on Kickstarter, what better time for me to summarise my experience of this game, discuss how it plays, and help you decide whether it is worth adding to your collection. Join me, if you're brave enough, for Final Girl. It's no accident that when we review a game on the channel, we are very careful to do so in respect of the core game experience first, and not prejudice the review with expansions or content that is not going to be experienced by a first time player. In this respect, Final Girl represents an unusual challenge in that its core game is insufficient to actually play a game. While the core game will provide you with many of the components required to play, it must be combined with one of the feature film boxes available before it can be used. Each feature film box will contribute unique killers, locations and final girls, and whilst it is often most thematic to combine the location and killer in a given box together, these can be completely interchanged with any of the other feature films. These variables are more than just aesthetic. Each killer operates very differently, and specific locations will contribute unique events and special rules to the game. So bear in mind when I explain the rules of this game, that your first experience of those rules could be incredibly different depending on which feature film box you choose. And I'm going to say straight up that I think not including the necessary components to at least play one scenario straight from the core box is a downside to this game. It may be thematically in keeping with its own aesthetic, video or Blu-ray players rarely having been supplied with films included of course, but as much as I can appreciate that it does create some issues. Leaving aside the fact that this will definitely, without doubt, catch someone out, because of course it will, sooner or later, no matter how clearly it is written on the box, it also means that there is no de facto entry point to the game for new players. I appreciate there is an argument to say that this gives players the flexibility to pick the villain or location or final goal that most appeals to them, but even if all the killers are precisely equal in their difficulty and complexity, which I don't think is true, it immediately creates the question of how you teach a game to players when that game changes, and changes quite significantly, depending on the combination of components involved. Most how-to guides I have seen appear to centre in on hands being the most vanilla of the Series 1 killers, which is probably why I have yet to be able to get my hands on that particular feature film box. Perhaps a partial rebuke to this is that being a solo experience, teaching the game to other players is a secondary consideration, unless you happen to be trying to explain the game in a YouTube review. I can't deny that there is a core set of rules for the game, albeit one that is immediately modified the first time you play, and I must compliment Van Ryder Games and the game's designers for the clarity and intuitiveness of that core rule set. There are a lot of potential interactions and plenty of detail to this game, and the rulebook is genuinely one of the least confusing board game rulebooks for a game this complex that I've read in some time. Your objective is simple enough to explain, albeit less so to achieve. If your chosen final girl destroys the killer, you win, even if you somehow reach a position where they simultaneously destroy each other. Somewhat obviously, if your final girl becomes just another of the killer's victims, you lose. The game mechanics operate around two currencies that you will need to manage during the game, these being time, indicated by the hourglass symbols, and also the number of dice you can roll when taking an action, thereby affecting the probability that you will complete an action successfully. The structure of the game will make more sense if we look at an example action first. Let's say you want to walk your final girl from one space to another. First of all, you will need a walk card in your hand that you can play to take this action. You will then undertake a horror roll to see if that action is successful. The number of dice you will roll can be modified in a number of ways, 
but at a base level will be determined by the horror level within the game. We'll discuss horror in more detail later. In this example, if regardless of the number of dice rolled, you roll a 5 or a 6 on two or more dice, you are considered to have two or more successes, and in this example will be able to move your final goal up to two spaces, will lose one unit of time for doing so, and may then decide what to do next. A single 5 plus will give you one success, allowing you to move a single space whilst losing one unit of time. If none of your dice are successes, you may still move one space, but at the cost of a point of health and two units of time. Sometimes you will also be given the choice of essentially aborting the action, in this case not moving at all, or taking any damage, but losing two units of time. If any of your dice come up with a result of three or four, you will see this double card symbol. These dice can be upgraded to a success at the cost of discarding two unused action cards. As action cards are your primary mechanism for manipulating the game state, and as they often cost time to acquire in the first place, this is a relatively expensive method of gaining successes. But what can I say, there's a killer out there, so sometimes needs must. Different action cards will create different effects, take different amounts of time to use, and require different quantities of successes, but they all follow this basic mechanic. You will notice that even a successful walk action will result in you losing time. While some cards can gain you additional time, generally the more actions you take, the more your time is reduced, and failing actions often results in a larger time penalty. Time must be carefully managed during the game, as it is both a tax for taking actions, and the means by which you will add more possible actions to your hand. So let's look at a standard turn sequence in Final Girl. First of all, the Final Girl enters the action phase. In this phase, you will use action cards in your hand to take as many actions as you have both the cards and the time to undertake, ranging from movement to attacking the killer to all sorts of other options besides. Horror rolls will determine how successful these actions are, and you will, as a general rule, start to run out of time. You may also discard action cards during this phase to gain an equal number of additional units of time. If at any point during this phase your time marker falls below zero, you will conclude the current action, and then the action phase will finish. However, there are good reasons that you might wish to end this phase more quickly. This is because during the next phase, the planning phase, you will have the opportunity to purchase new action cards that will add to your hand during the next turn. For example, providing we had at least two units of time left, we could purchase this sprint card ready for the following action phase. There are six zero-cost action cards in the game, but most action cards will be paid for using the time left over from your action phase. Once completed, your time will reset and any unspent time will be lost, though often you'll find you have less time to spend than you might have liked. Cards that were played or discarded during your action phase will not be available to purchase again during the planning phase that immediately follows, so you will also need to consider when to hold back specific actions ready for the moment that you need them. Once the planning phase is complete, the killer will have their phase, but this is a good moment to pause and consider the game board itself in more detail. Here you see a typical location setup for the game. The killer is represented by a red meeple, and the final girl by a pink meeple. The map is also populated by a number of yellow meeples representing the killer's other potential victims. These are the fodder you'll have seen in every horror movie ever written, and the mechanics of the game will generally cause the killer to stalk and kill these meeples. Each time this happens, the killer's bloodlust increases, generally making them more dangerous or faster, and potentially triggering other effects such as increasing the horror level, which changes the number of dice you roll during the action phase, or enabling the killer's dark power ability. One possible strategy for the final girl, therefore, is to save these victims before they can be targeted by the killer. Whenever the final girl moves from one space to another, she may take with her up to two victim meeples. If she manages to reach the green exit space, any meeples on the space with her may be saved, moving to the final girl's card to activate additional benefits for the final girl, but also preventing the killer from ever claiming them. Once all spaces on the final girl's card have been filled, the card may be flipped to activate the final girl's unique ultimate ability, and she will continue to get a benefit from further victims saved. The killer's phase is the antithesis of these mechanics. Here you will resolve the killer's action, shown next to this icon, and will then resolve a terror card. Perhaps the killer will try to reach the final girl and attack her, or perhaps he will go after other victims, or perhaps some other change to the game state will occur. It all depends on the card that is drawn. 
you start the game with a deck of 10 terror cards, and once these have all been revealed and resolved, the killer's finale card will flip, and that will be their action card for the remainder of the game. Needless to say, it can be beneficial to have defeated the killer, or at least be in a strong position to do so, before this stage. By restricting you to only 10 of the possible terror cards for your scenario, the game also ensures that the killer's turns are genuinely unpredictable, even if you are playing the same killer and location over multiple playthroughs. Once the killer's turn is complete, any living victims in the same space as the killer in a turn where the killer has dispatched another victim already will potentially panic. You will roll a die for each victim, and they will move according to the numbers printed around their current area on the map. This is broadly the core rules and sequence for the game, but what I have brushed over in the interest of time are all the different possible actions that can be taken by the final girl and killer that can completely change the outcome and narrative of the game. For example, certain situations will result in events being drawn that can have a dramatic effect on the game state. The final girl can also, subject to having the relevant action card, search for items at certain locations on the map, potentially equipping themselves with weapons to defeat the killer, or items that help her heal, or a vast array of other benefits. The tarot cards also intensify the game in exciting, if often bloody, ways, and because this deck is a combination of the location and killer cards, these often play out in ways that are extremely thematic for the combination of situations you have chosen for your horror movie. Final Girl is not on the face of it the most complicated board game around, but it is certainly complex enough. With no other players to help remind you, it is easy to miss small rules interactions, particularly with persistent effects of event cards, which will often trigger at very different times in the game turn. There is enough variability in the rules generated from the different feature films, setup options and random draw of terror and event cards that each game you play will end up being at least slightly unique. And whilst that is great from a replayability perspective, it does require a certain amount of concentration. In that respect, it isn't the first game I would recommend to someone inexperienced in modern board games, unless they were particularly interested in the theme. While we're on the topic of who this game is or isn't suitable for, clearly the game's theme demands its fairly high age rating of 14+, but I can understand why this isn't higher. From what I've seen of the game so far, it doesn't often seek to the level of the grotesque, despite its setting. Most of the cards in the game don't have any real artwork, and the pieces are generally inoffensive meeples and tokens. As a result, the game is to some extent only as horrific as the narrative you construct in your mind, and I personally wouldn't be too worried about playing this game in the vicinity of younger gamers, unlike many other similarly themed games. In terms of components, the quality is pretty much what you'd expect. I personally find the meeples to be perfectly adequate as markers in the game, though miniature sets are available if you want to upgrade the aesthetic. My only criticism is that even for someone with normal colour vision, I find the red meeple of the killer and the magenta meeple of the final girl hard to distinguish under fluorescent light. Some of the tokens are also surprisingly fiddly and easy to knock during gameplay. Assessing the difficulty of a game like this is once again made difficult by the lack of a core set killer. For example, my first experience of this game was using Inkanyamba the Avenger as the killer, and there seems to be some level of consensus among fans of this game that they represent one of the more difficult killers to defeat. For all I know, there is a killer out there I have yet to play that I would find much more straightforward to beat. But the sense I get is that this is a game that isn't meant to be easy to win, a game where victories are rare. If you're not the sort of person that enjoys losing a game you are essentially playing against yourself, this is definitely a factor that may give you pause. It is also fair to say that luck plays a heavy role in the outcome of the game. The starting position of the victims, how soon the killer starts killing victims, and most certainly the roll of the dice, are all factors that you can't control, and can be the difference between a swift death or a closely fought battle or indeed victory. But with so many options available to you, so many instances in which your choices will prove to be the thing that makes the difference, these elements of luck end up feeling like the killer acting against you rather than just fluke. For myself, I have to say that as frustrating as it is to be defeated by the game, and sometimes those defeats will be swift enough to make you feel like an idiot, let me assure you, I can't think of many games of Final Girl I have played that haven't been incredibly enjoyable regardless of the ending. The real beauty of this game is the way it introduces narrative, even without the benefit of a host of players. Leaving aside the different attributes and playstyles of the different killers and final girls, there are all sorts of little touches to make each game feel unique. 
For example, when you or the killer reach zero health, you flip a token on their board that you randomly select during the setup of the game. If the other side of this token turns out to be blank, nothing more occurs, but sometimes it will convey a final quantity of health. If it is your final girl benefiting from this mechanic, this is her last chance. Perhaps she has fooled the killer into thinking she is dead, or has suddenly summoned one last ounce of strength. Alternatively, perhaps you will experience the classic horror movie trope of a killer you thought had been defeated inexplicably turning out to still be a threat. Events and item cards also contribute to the unique narrative of each game. Some cards will convert the otherwise nameless victims on the board into new characters that behave in new and interesting ways. What if that victim you are trying to save turns out to be drawing the killer towards them with their excessive noise like the uber tourist, or is using their knowledge of the location to help you move more quickly like the tour guide? The characters often change your strategy or create a whole new mini-game within the game to contend with and it always feels like an unexpected twist in the story, whether for good or ill. I've also grown to really love that this is a pure solo experience, not a game with a solo mode, because that too fits the theme. The outcome of the game comes down to your choices. There is, narratively and mechanically, nobody else to help you. Four or five playthroughs of this game was all it took for me to genuinely understand the passion of the community of players that are already fans of this game. I really get it. I get the exquisite suspense of changing up your tactics a little, or getting just a little helping hand of luck, and suddenly you are saving victims and charging up your final girl. Maybe you find just the right item to help you attack the killer, or use reaction cards to block or deal damage back to the killer, and suddenly you realise, you can do this, your hair's breadth from winning the game. And then the dice go awry. The killer gets through your guard and with an extra attack to boot, and you know it's all over. You could re-roll, nobody would know, but you don't because it would be hollow. You know that you failed, and your final girl was just another victim after all. But you were so close. And hey, it was in Kinyamba. Everybody on the internet tells you that they're the hardest killer anyway. And you really were so close. So you re-rack. You desperately try to change the story and defeat your killer, and maybe, just maybe, you do. And the satisfaction that comes from that is more than just winning or overcoming a difficult game engine. It makes you feel like you really were the final girl, triumphing over the odds like an absolute boss. At least, I assume it does. I'm still waiting for my first win. Incan Yamba, what can I say? My first exploration as a final girl more than justified its reputation for being one of the best solo game experiences money can buy, and I honestly can't wait to plug even more feature film sets into the game, mix and match different combinations of killer and location and final girl, and see what new stories that creates. Which begs the question, what other final girl content would you like to see on the channel in the future? Would it make a good candidate for one of our narrative playthrough videos? Would you be interested in painting tutorials for the miniature expansions? Or would you devour reviews of the individual feature film packs with the voraciousness of a serial killer? Drop a comment and let us know. It was a comment that directly led us to making this review, and if we're going to continue exploring this game on the channel, we want our viewers to have a say in the form that takes. We'll return from the grave in a straight-to-VHS sequel very soon, dear viewers, but until then, be sure to work hard, play better, and take care out there.